Today we're beginning a brand new series in Steps of Faith. This series, three-week series, will be on spiritual disciplines. So right off the top, what are spiritual disciplines? Well, they're habits, practices, and experiences that are designed to develop, grow, and strengthen certain qualities of our spirit to build our spiritual muscles so that our character grows and we expand in our inner life for God. The structure of the workouts help our character grow and they train our soul. Some spiritual disciplines are personal, inward exercises that are practical uh, and they're, they're to be practiced alone. Others require interpersonal relationships and are practiced in community. Throughout time, People have proposed a number of practices that might be considered spiritual disciplines. It's important for us to note that the Bible nowhere gives us a list of spiritual disciplines. So I've included most that anyone would list. But some of these do not make everyone's list. I'm just going to run down through the entire list uh, that I have compiled. They include meditation, prayer, fasting, simplicity, fellowship, journaling, chastity and self-denial, stewardship, submission or obedience, study, evangelism and disciple-making, contemplation, confession, solitude, gratitude, self-examination, silence, and finally, worship. Now, we are not going to cover all of these spiritual disciplines in our three weeks. Why practice self disciplines. Well, every athlete must train to win. No one can sit down on the couch eating Cheetos for months and hope to compete. The best athletes are intensively discipled. They follow a strict diet and exercise regimens to beat their body into peak physical condition so that when the game is on the line, they are ready to go. We know this is true for physical condition, but there's a disconnect with how we put this into practice in our spiritual lives. The sad reality is that many Christians are unfit because they are undisciplined. No one drifts into discipline. Just as the undisciplined body becomes sluggish and fat, the undisciplined spirit becomes weak. This is why Paul coaches Timothy and says these words, train yourself to godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. As it holds promise for training, not only in the present life, but also for the life to come. So spiritual disciplines fall into two categories, abstinence or self-denial and engagement, connecting relationship 
with God and others. What are the purposes of the spiritual disciplines? Well, the goal or purpose of spiritual disciplines is to build spiritual bodies that glorify God and point others to Christ. Thomas Merton said, and I quote, Ask me not where I live and what I like to eat. Ask me what I am living for and what I think is keeping me from living fully for that. Spiritual disciplines are for all believers and many are either commanded or encouraged in the Bible. However, I do believe that God has made us differently and we may have certain disciplines that each of us need to practice more. So let's dig in. Right away, we're going to jump into meditation. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. What is biblical med meditation? There are 23 times meditation is used in the Bible. There are several words in the Bible that translate as a form of meditation, depending on their context, including speak, utter, imagine, and muse. And even once where the word for meditate is translated sing. What biblical meditation isn't? Biblical meditation is not sitting with an empty mind. It's not mindlessly repeating a single word or phrase to gain some sort of altered state. It's not burning candles or sitting calmly on a rug listening to music, and it's not practicing yoga. Biblical meditation isn't even primarily for relaxation, although you may find it calming and comforting. It's not about controlling your breathing, although there may be times when deep breaths are helpful. It's never mindless. Instead, meditation means that your mind is focused on God and His Word. Psalm 19 verse 14 says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This week I've been meditating on a passage in Matthew 27, considering it for an upcoming sermon. And as I've meditated on it, I've had a revelation of how darkness fell on the earth during Jesus' crucifixion. I'll be sharing that in my upcoming mes message. Meditation is reading God's Word, thinking about it, but then allowing God's Spirit to speak into your life. It begins with Scripture. Meditation begins with Scripture. Secondly, meditation is being attentive to Jehovah God. Colossians 3.1 says, Since then... You have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So, with what goal do we meditate? 
Well, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to trust and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Meditation is good for body, soul, and spirit, and it comes with a promise from God. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This is a premise, if we meditate, that comes with a promise that God will give us good success. Meditation is not a position of the body, but it can be enhanced through seeing God's creation. I have loved going out and sitting alone in God's creation. I'm reminded of what the psalmist David said in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Those are good words for us to remember about meditating. And meditation is to be on God himself. It's thinking on God, thinking on his word, and allowing his spirit to speak to us. There's a number of questions that we haven't answered about meditation, but uh, I encourage you to search it out on your own or to join a group study here at Sobel Christian Fellowship for uh, further education on what meditation is. Let me just close with four important ingredients of meditation. And I'm not going to spend time on these, but here are the four. Pray. It's difficult to know when meditation moves into prayer. It isn't really that important, but at some point, take the truth as the Holy Spirit has illustrated it and pray it back to God. Personalize. Where possible and according to sound principles of biblical interpretation, replace the names in Scripture with your own name. God never intended for His Word to float aimlessly in impersonal abstractions. He designed it for you and I. Thirdly, praise. So we pray, we personalize the Scripture, we praise. We worship the Lord for who He is and what He has done and how He has been revealed in Scripture. Meditation always leads us into adoration and celebration of God. And then finally, practice. Commit yourself to doing what the Word commands. The aim of meditation is for moral transformation, spiritual 
transformation. The aim of contemplation is obedience. And in obedience is joy inexpressible and full of glory. I have an assignment for you that I highly encourage because if you don't put this into practice as a discipline, really my teaching will be worthless. So I would like you to meditate on a portion of Scripture this coming week. Even take notes. Here's a couple passages that I would encourage you to meditate on. You might want to have a pen to write these down right now. 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. I'll read it. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human, or excuse me, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. Or, I recommend 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That again is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So I would encourage you to read these passages in several different versions. Get a complete understanding of what these words are teaching. The second spiritual discipline that we're diving into today is the discipline of prayer. Colossians 4, verses 2 and 4 say, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. F.B. Meyer, the author of the great little book, The Secret of guidance said, and I quote, the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Friends, in the last several months, my prayer life has grown. I have enjoyed this season where I have walked and talked with God. The fact of the matter is, you cannot really be a growing Christian and not pray. Just like you cannot have a growing marriage if you don't talk to your spouse. You can be a Christian and not pray, just like you can be married and not talk. However, in both circumstances, your fellowship will stagnate and you will never know the full benefit of your relationship. Prayer is the pipeline of communication between God and His people. I want to say, I think, for at least for me, prayer is the most difficult spiritual discipline that I do. It is a chore for me 
and I'm just being honest with you, to discipline myself to spend periods of time in prayer. There's always a million other things that I think I should be doing. But it's such a lie from the enemy. Prayer is important. Discipline in this series does not refer to punishment, but rather to rigorous spiritual training for the purpose of godliness. The spiritual disciplines are godly habit patterns that we develop over time. And I believe that the two most important spiritual disciplines in the Christian life are devotion to God's Word and prayer. Without a thorough commitment in your spiritual life, these two disciplines will simply fall by the wayside. So, I want to encourage you to get praying. You might say, when should we pray? Well, Jesus once told a parable to show that at all times we ought to pray and not to lose heart. Luke 18, 1. Paul instructed the Thessalonians that they should pray without ceasing. The Apostle Paul would often begin his letter saying that he was praying always for them, that he did not cease to pray. Now you may be asking, how is that even possible? How is that possible, Pastor Lenny, that I don't cease in praying? Well, I believe it's possible because we remain in a spirit of prayer. I find myself walking through the day and some, God brings something to mind and I immediately begin to pray for that need. Oftentimes I think these are random thoughts and yet, amazingly, quite often, that that person or situation that I have just been praying for comes back. I'll get a communication from someone that I hadn't had in a long time and I had just been praying for them. Remain in a spirit of prayer. How should we pray? Well, let me just give you what the New Testament teaches about how we should pray. First of all, with faith. All things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Matthew 21, 22. Pray according to God's will. Quote, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything, According to his will, he hears us. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Pray in the Holy Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Jude verse 20. Pray with devotion, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Romans 12. Pray with thanksgiving. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Colossians 4.2. Pray earnestly as, as we Night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. 1 Thessalonians 3.10 And pray being on the alert. God calls us to be alert. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit and with this in view, 
be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all saints. Ephesians 6.18 In what situations did Jesus pray? Let me quickly run through a, a few ways that Jesus prayed or when he prayed. He prayed at his baptism. Jesus evidently sought God's help as he began his public ministry. He prayed after the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. He prayed after a busy and exhausting night of miraculous ministry. He prayed before choosing his 12 apostles. He prayed when he was becoming increasingly popular. And he prayed before he went to the cross. Where did Jesus pray? He prayed in secluded places, in the wilderness, the mountain. He prayed alone. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe he was praying as he walked across the lake in the storm. What do all of these passages tell us about Christ's habits of prayers? He liked to pray alone. Even when he was facing the most horrific suffering imaginable, he still left Peter, James, and John and went off by himself to pray. That shouldn't surprise us, for Jesus instructed his disciples, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So why do you think the average Christian only spends less than five minutes a day in prayer. Did you hear that? The average Christian spends less than five minutes a day in prayer. Do you find it a spiritual battle to pray? I tell you that I do. How was Jesus able to hear the Father speak so well? Because he was in prayer. He walked in prayer with God. What's your assignment for this coming week? What's your discipline? And by the way, when I say this coming week, what I'm really hoping is that these spiritual disciplines... Maybe not all of them, but some of them you latch on to and they become a discipline every day of your life. Well, I want to encourage you this week to take several minutes each day to pray. And I pray the following acronym. It's, it's re really easy to remember. It forms the word ACTS. A-C-T-S. First is adoration. Pray worshiping your God for his faithfulness, for his love, for his dealing with us over and over again for, for the same sins. Confession. A is adoration, C is confession. Spend time confessing to God. Make sure you're in right relationship with Him. T, thanksgiving. Verbalize what you're grateful for in your life and in the world around you. And finally, S, supplication. Pray for the needs of others and yourself. Now, I want to stop here and say, I don't know why, but we are a selfish people. We often put our needs in front of everything else. And so what we 
have as prayer time is usually, God, give me this. God, give me that. God, I want this. I've often said that one of the things I've had against prayer meetings is because they become a organ recital. In other words, people come to pray about their organ and that God would heal it. Friends, our number one prayer should not be for our health. It should be for those around us who have yet to know Jesus, for the world that we live in. It should be thanking God for who he is and and worshiping him and then confessing our sins. Well, this wraps up our our first segment of Steps of Faith. We'll be coming back uh, uh, in session two with three more spiritual disciplines.